<clears throat> captions. There we go. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Greetings. Uh, hey, Barry. Good to see you. Howdy. We are in Denver, where overnight it snowed big fluffy flakes with no wind. So the trees are just holding up a whole bunch of snow. It's really beautiful outside. Um, I had picked as a topic and can be easily steered in other directions if other people are more interested in things. But um, we, I, I added a thought a couple of weeks ago to my brain called, we are in a post GPT world. Already? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and what I, what I mean by, what I meant by doing that was GPT had been out for a while. We're on GPT-3. Chat <laughs> GPT is based on 3.5. There's Dolly, and there was a whole bunch of fuss about making synthetic art imagery, and that was going on. And then it seemed to me that when Chat GPT-3 hit, <laughs> there was a change in kind uh, a change in tone, a change in energy, a change of some sort, where all of a sudden, at least many of my communities were just humming and buzzing. A lot of my friends were busy experimenting and doing cool stuff. And there were a whole bunch of articles and other kinds of things out in the world uh, where, um, where it seemed like the, the realm of possibilities of what's up and what's going on was uh, kind of breaking open. Uh, Rick, I think I've got some background noise from your mic. I'm going to mute you. Um, and so that's the the premise behind we are in a post GPT world. Uh, and I'm wondering, I, I'm and partly I'm wondering, what does that even mean? Uh, how are you all experiencing it? Do you agree? Uh, does this just seem like yet another day? Uh, you know, on on the uh, on the island, trying to see who gets voted off next. Uh, Scott, please. I'll jump in from the visual side. So you're talking about the the generated art that's coming out of of all sorts of places, and I'm I'm following that for a couple of reasons. One, I'm in the art creation world. Um, two, I have a number of illustrator friends who became concerned that they found their art as part of the source art, and when you you know hoover up billions of images, that's that's what happens. But what I saw recently, and I haven't finished reading the article, was an interesting comment that it has forever changed the way that software is being built. Because what happened was in the space of a month or so, the internet was flooded with AI generated images. And that's where the images came from that were the sources for training the software. And so it's created this loop where now the people who are doing serious work in this are unable to get a pure signal because the images that they would, how do you separate from an AI generated image from an actual image? You, you can't anymore because they're so well done. And so it's created this loop which I think would relate also to the text that you're talking about. So that's just a way to kick that off is that maybe I think Gil, you had said post as in, are we already past, you know, and, and I, if I understood that correctly, it, it feels like at least in the uh, image world, we may be in a post because it's, it has been posted. <laughs> and everywhere and and so anyway that was that was an interesting thing i had, had come across um thanks scott and, and a way that i'm phrasing i think what you just said is that for me the boundary between reality and synthetically generated stuff is getting blurry <clears throat> that it's harder to identify what's 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 human generated and what's not human generated i'm not going to say what's real and what's not because what's artificially generated it becomes just as real the moment it's in our sphere uh, so I don't know that this is necessarily about reality, although it kind of is because 
what we think of as real, the real world is kind of now squishy in some way. That may be a more interesting philosophical conversation. Well, I, I I think you you grasped what I was saying. And what I think is interesting is that now it's created these loops where I grab source material as a human and use it to create something which then a computer can grab and use as source material. So is it necessarily bad? I, I don't know, because I, I know that people have talked about, at least in Photoshop, they have AI filters that I use. I control as a human and select remove background. Well, all right, so have I now, you know, that that's, I have a prosthetic limb, you know, it's a mouse <laughs> and it's, it's creating this. Uh, I'm I'm using that. So so I don't know if it's a it's a line between human created and 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 not. Um, but I think it it does create that loop. Your loop image makes me think of the Ouroboros, which is the, the the snake eating its own tail. It's like society has suddenly started eating its own tail, and we're we're ingesting as inputs things that were busy creating moments earlier, and that gets weird. Um, Mike, then Gil. A um, couple of quick comments. Uh, as you know, I care a lot about words and <clears throat> the impression they leave. And I, I would say that uh, post GPT is not the phrase to use. I mean, it, we're going to be playing with it for a long time. It's, it's we're not after the fact. It's so not. So I like... mean, I mean, I mean, post GPT, as in the world has been changed by GPT. I don't mean that GPT is behind us in any way at all. I mean, right. that well, that's that's the, the world. point. Is that is that saying post in many people's mind feels it's you know oh that phase is over or it's declining you know we used to talk about the post PC world and you know PCs didn't go away but we sure played a lot more with phones and other devices and um, you know the PC became kind of passe. So I have edited the thought not, name. I have edited the thought name per your advice right now. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, but the other point though is I, 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 I'm a little selfish here. I don't get to come in on the, um, the topic Thursdays very often because I usually have a conflict. Um, I would love to use GPT as the seed for a, a broader discussion about predictions for 2023, and, and maybe you were planning to do that in two weeks, but. I, I think the most fun thing about GPT is thinking about how it's going to be used next and what 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 the impact will be. But I think there's a couple other things that are going to cause some radical changes in the coming year as well. And uh, you know the, the the new way we approach crypto and the new skepticism. I mean, there, there's just a uh, there's a bunch of really big changes coming in the next eighteen months. But I think I'm happy to start with GPT, but I'd, I'd, I'd encourage people to think forward rather than just stories, share stories about what they've done already. Um, you know, I, 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 I've been impressed and perplexed by the different articles I've read on GPT. Uh, Larry Magid wrote, wrote, uh, wrote a really interesting Facebook post. He asked, chat gpt to write a poem about facebook and it was kind of pedestrian poetry but it had some real insights on the dangers of facebook it was really quite uh, quite deep i'll see if i can find it um cool i just did a quick google and it didn't turn it up and i'm sure that somebody will will find it um and, and my intention was to look forward with it I think we need to tell some stories of what's possible just to, so that we're sort of on the same page of, of OMG. Um, but I like what you're doing, what you're saying, Mike. And also it, it's a great idea to do some, some looking ahead for 2023, which is a good thing to do at the turn of the turn of the year. Um, Gil, then Doug, then Patty. Then Doug. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, good, good morning, everybody. Happy holidays. And Mike, thank you for that. I agree with everything that you said, starting with the post. I, that was That was my reaction to post. And I think uh, with that clarification, sure, maybe it's a different word, but I think the instinct is an, is an important one. Um, a, a few random thoughts on this. Um, 
you know, it seems that every time a major new technology has entered the world, people have been freaked out by it and thought this is a terrible thing and it's going to ruin everything. And, um, you know, maybe maybe that's been right going back to the wheel, but this is another one of those. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, you know, the the IP questions loom large for me because uh, everybody's work is now scooped up into this into this blend. <laughs> Uh, and how creators are honored and rewarded. And we've already, you know, we're already lo long past the hope of micropayments sustaining regular folks. And this is another blow to that, it seems. Um, and I'm willing to be surprised. Um, uh, uh, um, I resonated very much with what Scott, you said about no more pure signal. Um, and I look at that in the light of the COVID stories of the last few years. I had a dialogue yesterday with a friend who's an extremely intelligent, cogent, thoughtful, uh, former engineer, former emergency room position, uh, physician, uh, who told me that he's not taking any more vaccines. And, um, for, and I asked him for his sources, and his sources were YouTubes of deniers talking which is fine, but gave me no reference points into research, data, documentation. You know, it's 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 hard. If if sourcing is there in YouTube in interviews, it's very hard to find. And I'm kind of old fashioned. I want to look at something and see a site and follow it and see the data and see the graphs. And so long diversion. So here he is in a world of how did he form his instinct and intuition and judgment? And this is I'm asking of a guy who I deeply respect. Um, if the provenance of the signal is obscured by the GPT, how do we ever do that again? How does, you know, how do we distinguish between, well, you know, between grounded um, and original information and, and the other stuff that comes? So that's sort of one thread of question. Um, <clears throat> and the other thread of question is that this feels like the, you know, the folks who just announced that they've, the private companies that's proceeding on global climate intervention, you know, to shield the planet from the sun. Uh, uh, no asking for permission, no authorization from anybody, no peer review. They just, they got the bucks and they're going to do it. So that's happening. And so I, I feel a parallel of, you know, the GPT ice nine dropped into the oceans of the world and it happens. And there we are. Um, and not to leave on that sour note, I think an interesting question for us is what possible impacts and value could this stuff have for us? as OGM. Uh, how does it contribute to what we're trying to do? How does it thwart what we're trying to do? Um, I'm, I, I'm fascinated by, by the power of it, by the mediocrity uh, of the work that it's generating. Um, but that's what happened with de desktop publishing back at the beginning also. And um, um, I was going to say, uh, and 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 part of my attraction to it is it seems it seems like having at my fingertips now and a massive army of research assistants who I normally couldn't afford. I mean, you know, I don't have an emeritus professorship with dozens of those folks at my fingertips. But you know, for folks like us, we could ask a question and get you know six months of research in six seconds, and then filter it through smart human beings and conversation and so forth, and elevate the level of the game. So as an adjunct. Um, it's interesting. Uh, my, my wife has long argued against uh, the term artificial intelligence. Uh, she prefers to call it simulated intelligence, which I think is kind of an interesting provocation. But in this case, it's maybe augmented intelligence. And that is an interesting prospect. Um, in the hands of global capitalism, maybe not so much, but, you know, good stuff for us to chew into. I'm um, thanks, Gil. Uh, two things, I think. Um, one on a list I'm on, Christopher Allen basically explained how he used uh, G chat GPT to outline, and I'm going to mess up the details here, but basically he wanted to create a science fiction series, and he asked it to create characters and a plot and a 600 word blog post about it and six alternate titles or 10 alternate titles and a bunch of other things. And then he showed us in a long email, like, like what that did. And it wasn't perfect. It wasn't done. It's not going to put scriptwriters out of work tomorrow. But OMG, it was a rich and interesting starting point for for speeding up that process enormously. And my my eyebrows were like glued to my hairline uh, just from 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 that and a few stories like it. And now, if you could internalize that, and as a human who apparently can't multitask, but if you could multitask to have several of these things out 
doing your your work for you at the same time concurrently and manage that concurrency in some way i don't i can't fully imagine what a human with that capacity would be doing or could be doing or could produce it's like crazy so yes our omg ogm exactly uh, and then this uh, and then the second thing is artificial intelligence is just this cranky ass term we keep coming back to it it's a, it's it's like a, a bad term I, i'll post a little video that I, I created some years ago trying to distinguish between neural networks ai machine learning and a few other things um, i tend to say machine learning or machine intelligence intelligence is even a pesky word so machine learning is sort of like a good blanket for these things but uh, I'll, I'll post that um just if i can just add one other yeah. thing i actually just thought of a, a a project that i'm willing to try this thing out on i've got a whole bunch of legacy writings that i've been wanting to turn into an anthology jerry you know and you and i have an open loop to talk about that and tools for doing that but i'm wondering if i turn chat gpt3 loot whatever it's called <laughs> if i turn this thing loose on like you know 30 or 40 articles and said turn this into a book i wonder what it would do so we'll find out. I'll let you know. Totally agree. Uh, Doug B. Yeah, I, um, Gil, where you left off, um, I've been spending way too much immersive time with, with Carl. Um, but you know, the 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 Doug Engelbart augment human augmentation. This is sort of that. Welcome, Carl. <laughs> this is sort of that writ large and um i think you know the legal question because i'm a lawyer sort of fallen lawyer but i'm a lawyer um the whole ip schema based on ownership control and scarcity made no sense for a while and this i think sort of blows that you know sort of lands that and and reveals the intrinsic challenge and problem with that going forward. Um, but consistent with Doug's vision of sort of chained provenance being captured and, and welded to the thing, the property, the, the content um, as an aggregative history being written which sort of has reflective dimensions of what um, you know, crypto and um, and the tale of previous transactions, you know, sort of mirrors and and ties into that somehow in terms of keeping track of a a, a growing aggregative um, and alive chain of provenances associated with things built on top of things built on top of things. So all of that sort of is starting to, for me, there's sort of a center of gravity somewhere in there for what the new paradigm might be. And, and the last pieces were, um, Farinanda had, had added a comment to somebody's post, but had referred to the fact that it, she used it as a polisher it sort of made her end product better. Uh, but she or somebody else in that same thread alluded to the fact that um, most of what it would generate left up to its own devices with a modest prompt was pedestrian. But every once in a while, there would be a line that was just magnificent <laughs> and that would energize the rest. And so there is this um, kismet dimension of um, out of the pedestrian um, comes, you know, true sparks, um, which doesn't seem all that different to me from human ahas and intuitions, you know, occurring randomly. And, you know, what's our percentage of quote genius out of the mass of stuff that's generated? Um, that doesn't I have the same, and just to end, I have the same issue with artificial intelligence, which implies um, a level of thinking understanding as opposed to very advanced pattern matching and correlations. Um, that um, in a purely 
Doug Engelbart augmentation frame. Um, these technologies make everybody empowered and better for their, their uh, being made easy to use um, for as many people as humanly for as many people as humanly possible um, to enable everybody to be a better creator or to be a, a faster or more efficient generator. Um, you know what to do with the exponential increase in volume and output. You know, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, and with that, I'm complete. Uh, thanks, Doug. Um, Pete was making the point in the chat a moment ago that we are now leveled up with ex expert chops on playing instruments, using paints, whatever else it might be. I mean, you can offer a text prompt and a country Western. It'll be like, whose line is it anyway? Like full time for everybody, although not as funny. Um, and, and, and in particular, because it just gets coughed up right away, as opposed to being human geniuses standing in front of us, like creating these songs on the fly, which is like why we're so impressed and and, and like doubled over laughing. Uh, Patty, you were next in my queue, but you fell out and came back in. So why don't you go next and then we'll go to, to Doug C. Carl, Mike. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, um, I hate to slow the conversation down, um, but I would love the opportunity to understand um, chat GPT a little better. I've been following the email chains that have been circulating and I saw the uh, the information from what Tibet posted um, and the conversation that that they'd had with, uh, with this chat GPT. And I can relate to Jerry's feeling of the eyebrows being like, what am I seeing? And so, um, but beyond that, I don't really feel like I have much of a frame of reference as to how large this thing is. Um, how is this different than things we've seen in the past? And I would love it if we could spend a couple minutes. Um, I would just love to hear from anyone who cares to share. Uh, how's this different from things you've seen in the past? General fears, anxieties about whatever this thing is. And um, do we, it sounds like I'm picking up that there's a positive potential here. I just don't have much of a frame of reference for what this thing is. So. Thanks, Patty. Um, yeah. Also, if anybody wants to share really good uh, what is ChatGPT articles in the chat, that would be helpful. Um, I can only get as far as like neural networks as opposed to expert systems as opposed to other things and so forth. I don't have a sense for the volume uh, with which this was trained, et cetera, et cetera. Anybody in the room uh, feel up to an explanation? None of us. I think uh, Pete is in uh, chat only mode, listen only mode today. He could probably take a swing at that. Uh, but uh, I'm trying to figure out how we might do that. Um, I'm uh, curious, Patty, if you could clarify what level of technical depth you're looking for here. Um, uh, shallow layman's terms. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Yeah. Yeah. Shallow depth, preferably not. I don't have a lot of language. Um, or deep understanding of uh, technology. And so, as, so I'm thinking perhaps, perhaps Jerry, we're not looking for this as a as the next level of GPT-2, but rather what is this as a category? Um, yeah, but, but also like uh, one of the big breakthroughs here is that GPT-3 was trained, has, uh, is able to hold as its pattern knowledge, um, a, a large mass of human uh, works, but only up to a certain date, I think in 2021, and it has no connection to current search engines. So chat GBT at some point doesn't know any events that happened after a particular date because they're not in its training uh, repertory. Um, also, one thing I learned a long time ago, because I was a neural networks analyst in 1990, when I was a tech industry trends analyst in the second lifetime of neural networks. The first lifetime was back in the 50s and 60s and ended with a book titled Perceptrons that was written by Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert, who were wrong, but managed to chill all research into neural networks for more than a decade because they said neural networks are impossible. And they were only right about single layered neural networks where you're trying to simulate how neurons work in the head, kind of electrochemically in some sense. Um, and what happened was people started to get more computational power and much more sophistication. And you've got what's why we call it deep learning is that now you have layers of, of simulated neurons that are all set up in really interesting sort of uh, architectures, which is why these models can now absorb and hold that much information and, and they're creating patterns. As far as I understand it, these systems are not 
remembering or storing clips of what they learned. They're just absorbing all of the, 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 the things that, they, that they're trained on and then forming patterns that, that model, oh, okay, these words in sequence make sense and are apparently a terrific article and a good way to make prose. Then the other lesson I had back in the day when I was trying to help corporations figure out whether or not to use any of these technologies was some problems that look relatively simple are actually a sequence of problems. Uh, first, you have to identify characters. Then you have to parse out. Then you, so then you have to parse out the words. Then you have to make sense. And, and here, what we're seeing is a system that has the ability to take our random generated English sentences and turn that into some sort of query into the system. That itself is difficult. Then speaking it back to us in very elegant prose in some organized sense is really important and works differently. Um, I'll point here to, um, there was a point a couple of years ago where Google swapped out the back end of Google Translate. And they swapped it from a, a more traditional, let's parse sentences, let's do sentence structure, let's then translate, and then let's reassemble into more of a neural network, a large language model. And all of a sudden, the beauty and comprehensibility of their translations leaped. Alas, unfortunately, the training body that they used was professional translators, translated works, and there were a whole bunch of professional translators who were really pissed off because their works had been sort of absorbed into this thing as training. Uh, and all of a sudden, there was a system that was automated that was pretty good at doing this. Um, that's one swing at this. Anybody else? Uh, I'll come back to the queue in a second, but anybody else? Raise your hand if you want to add to the explanations about ChatGPT and where we are. Uh, also, Pete is posting some things in the in the chat that are worth looking at. Obviously, uh, Mr. Homer. I don't claim any expertise in this area, but I've read a few articles, and one thing that stood out for me is that because it's searching the web, we have the old garbage in, garbage out. It it is not um, discerning about what it takes in, so you can get a lot of crappy stuff in there. If there's if it's searching, uh, you know sexist text you're going to get sexist output so it's just important to bear that in mind it doesn't have the discernment to say this is true this is this is appropriate uh, microsoft fielded an uh, an artificial a virtual character called k some years ago and put it out on the web for people to come interact with 4chan got a hold of it and trained it up on a whole bunch of really crappy stuff and microsoft had to pull it down in a hurry uh, because it suddenly started spewing like nazi philosophy and, and whatever else uh, so these things are only as good as what they're absorbing. And if you have a sexist, misogynist, and otherwise strange society, and those are the things you're feeding into the system, then the system is going to mirror a lot of that in ways and, that and in ways that are maybe hard to detect and control. Go ahead, Ken. And you get clippy. And you get clippy. <laughs> exactly. Poor Clippy. Suffered such a bad fate. Um, hope that helps, Patty. And we'll if if anybody else comes up with more on that, uh, we'll just jump back into it as we go through the the conversation. Let me go to Doug Carmichael. So I'm assuming we're past the stage of negotiating what the topic is. So I'll go along with the one that we seem to be on. And my view is that being in a world surrounded by images, music, and words that are created by machines is not very attractive. If I think of the, the rows of books behind me, everyone has a real person who wrote that book. And I know a lot of them. That's a very different experience. And I think it's like suddenly we're gonna be surrounded by an alien species that's putting out images, words, and music, and architecture, and government agencies, and other stuff that can be created artificially. Uh, I don't think I wanna live in that world. Uh, I want to hide out somewhere. Doug, thank you. And I think a bunch of people feel the way you just expressed. It's like this, this looks like a dicey venture and there doesn't seem to be a lot of adult supervision. Well, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Um, but a whole lot of things are up for grabs in ways that we don't have a lot of choice over. So I'm, I, I, I hear you and, the, and I'm with you. Well, and I want to add, uh, this group, like so many groups, is doing something very interesting. It's not talking about climate change. Uh, this seems to be a kind of universal pathology, uh, and it's really worth exploring. Um, thanks, Doug. Carl? 
uh, posted a couple links. There was that edge.org site um, that John Brockman uh, had organized uh, you, some really fascinating articles in there. But um, yeah, Doug, Doug and I had actually met taking a Howard Rheingold course back in 2013 and stuff. But um, I wasn't seeing the direct thing, but I remember seeing a conversation between Patty Mays and, and Howard Rheingold. And, and maybe it gets into that. There's that intelligence augmentation, and then um, they also talk about amplification, and I think that's one of the problems with with um, with this stuff that amp the amplification doesn't have the filters; it's just uh, type of stuff. So I think that's um, and then Ben Snyderman. I've been going back and looking at at, at some of his work and. He came out with a book um, back in February on uh, human-centered artificial intelligence, and he he um, likened it to a second Copernican revolution is is needed. We need to we need to have the algorithms revolving around humans, not in the way around. So, um, so that's um, a few few things to regarding this. I'm not. I'm not a big fan of it. I've been at some meetings uh, with um, with um, uh, blank on his name now, the architect of Siri and stuff, talking about code in the wild and stuff, and it's just that's just uh, really scary stuff as as far as I'm concerned because it can, you know, there are no breaks. Uh, Thanks, Carl. Um, two things I just wanted to add. One is that um, we're using the term hallucinations to represent things that ChatGPT and things like it come up with that it thinks are real but are are not real, and uh, it but it treats it as real and often will even sort of convincingly argue for as being real. And one of the threads I saw was a guy who said um, he was in a chat with ChatGPT, which which claimed that there was a Pablo Neruda poem and then quoted it. And then when probed, uh, insisted that this poem exists, but he's pretty sure this poem has never existed any place and was a, a basically a, a hallucination of uh, another poem with a similar but not exactly the same title, blah, 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 blah. That's really interesting. And then the second thing is ChatGPT is from OpenAI and Google, I think almost certainly has similar capacity, except it has a real-time search engine. So I'm this. I, this is based on nothing but my conjecture, but I'm willing to bet that Google can match what's being done with ChatGPT right now, and also tie it to fact-checking kind of real-time search, which you could think about as another feature to add to what this thing can do. So right now we're all worried that ChatGPT is hallucinating and can't fact-check and all that. That's kind of true about the current architecture of the current thing, which is blowing all of our minds already. You start to glue these things together and then do a little bit better policing on what came out, and you could have much more complete and reliable results from some of these searches, I think. And um, I think that one of the one of Google's issues over time is how do we release what we have and what we know and the power tools we've got in a way that doesn't scare people, doesn't create uh, unintended consequences that are really negative, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know whether and how this might come out, but my hunch is they have they can match what ChatGPT is doing and probably do it one better from internal work. Uh, and Carl is pointing out that Adam Chire is, the, is the, the Siri guy and he put a post in the chat. Thank you. Um, Mike. Just a few things. Uh, first off, uh, regarding copyright, I posted a really useful article in the latest issue of The Economist. It's their special double issue at the end of the year and it's all about how much material is falling out of public domain. And then it goes a little deeper to say, how are we going to train the mega AI of the future that needs to know everything about everything if large parts of human knowledge is cordoned off behind paywalls? And so um, I, I think this is the fundamental issue. And the country that gets copyright right and reforms it for the machine learning era is going to have a huge advantage and we'll see whether uh, anybody does that the apparently the russians are kind of uh, pulling back on copyright enforcement since they're at war and they don't want to 
pay all the copyright royalties that uh, Western firms are demanding. But a couple other things, uh, you, we've talked about adult supervision and right now, OpenAI is providing some adult supervision. And if you ask chat GDP to do certain things, it will refuse. Uh, Moshe Vardy posted something where he, he said, write a really nasty, insulting poem about Moshe Verde. <laughs> and it wrote back, oh, I don't do that. That would be unkind. So there is some kind of ethics loop in there, ethics filter. But I also just posted a link to a tweet about uh, an open source implementation of GPT that could be used in all sorts of ways and might not have any adult supervision. The other thing to think about is that this it's a pretty small step from where we are to having a chat bot that really does make people feel they're talking to somebody, at least, at least somebody who's half drunk at the bar and making stuff up. And that might make a lot of lonely people in their 70s kind of happy. Um, we, we've uh, we've been waiting for this. The other thing that isn't too far off are the AI gen content, where you can, rather than asking for an essay on a topic, you ask for a video on a topic. And that, um, that's I how. I have a question, Mike. Uh, go ahead. Uh, what would it be like if instead of seeing the uh, Zoom squares here, uh, each one was a, a bot. And so the whole Zoom conversation would be between me and 20 bots. Would I want to do that? I think Mike's connection has just borked. No, I'm, I'm still here in video. Okay. Voice, I'm here. Um, I, I think well, that which would one? be incredibly useful for certain applications. It would be a great way for a novelist to play with dialogue you know just you know ha ha frame a topic and you know put in a setting and have five people to talk to and suddenly you have this rich dialogue some of which you could steal and put into your novel um i don't know i mean again i mean people who have dementia and are 87 years old in a nursing home are finding solace and comfort from these uh, anthropomorphic seals and dogs, they, they, and they, you know, they, they try to simulate animals and maybe there's also going to be some kind of uh, machine learning generated uh, three-year-old, which again, I, an elderly person might find very interesting and simple uh, enough to understand. Parents of autistic children have discovered that Siri and things like Siri are endlessly patient um, and good companions. And that's been really interesting in a very junior varsity version of where you're the future you're talking about, uh, Mike. Uh, Stacy, then Ken. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly say that's a real ethical problem for me, Mike, what you were saying. You know, the seals and the dog, you know, you're talking to a seal and a dog. Um, if you have somebody helping, you know, for memory or something like that, as long as the person knows, you know, it's a robot, that's one thing. But I'm, I've been spending a lot of time in singles groups, listening to them speaking, older people. And the only good thing about all this GP, you know, all of this, it's making regular people a little bit more critical in their thinking. At least that's my hope, that they're more critical. And is this person real? Is this person not real? But what it does emotionally to a person to find out that somebody they thought was a real person and then find out they weren't, that's just horrible. And this whole notion of thinking, well, it's for their own good. For me, that's an old paradigm that I just wanted to, to say. <laughs> I'm not totally good with that. <laughs> Stacy, I'm, I'm right there I with you. I didn't say I was either, but I said it's happening. Yeah, I'm. I'm right there with you. I, 
Mike, I know you're describing what's going on in the world, and I just find it really sad that there's it, we keep placing technology in the center where we need to be putting people. And there's plenty of people out there who would be happy to if they had the economic incentive to to be caring for elderly people and people on the spectrum and whatnot. And we're using machines instead. And I find that there's something just deeply disturbing to my soul when I hear that. I, you know, I'm, it's not a criticism or anything of you, Mike. It's just this, the state. Like, man, you know, I, like I live here in California, and we have this huge problem with um, sudden oak death. You know, we've got all these huge numbers of, of oak trees that have died, and all kinds of um, underbrush in the forest which are feeding the fires and there's plenty of people who would be happy to go out there and clean the forest and take these trees down and and lower the fuel load but there's no economic incentive for them to do so because it's considered that's too high a cost so instead we'll let our forest burn to the point where they won't be able to regenerate because the fires are so hot now so i just think we need to get people back in the center of our lens for how do we get together here and how do we get along and how do we take care of each other and how to take care of this place Thanks, Ken. Um, let's tilt ourselves toward 2023 and the future a bit. I'm sorry. I just had a funny thought that I'm... Please, Scott. So, so now I'm going to go onto YouTube and I'm going to see a video generated by some in intelligence. And all the comments are going to be coming from other intelligences. <laughs> so basically, I'm... I'm <laughs> I'm just a passive observer, and then they can go do what they're, and then I'll go outside and take a walk. So a piece of this turns into the ending of uh, uh, her, right? Where the intelligences have gotten better than us and are busy socializing and like, thanks, bye-bye. Um, I don't know who iPhone is, who uh, who's just come in, but if you uh, want to jump into the conversation. Oh, it's John, cool. Hi, yeah, I'm outside. <laughs> with my phone and you know you know what that's like uh, just a note this may have i came in late so this may have already been mentioned a uh, a good dramatic exploration of the uh use of robots in the form of surrogate humans is a movie called marjorie prime which you can see for free um and it's 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 obviously a, a human written script. And, and you know there are lots of signs that it is a human written script attempting to simulate what a future might be like where uh, loved ones who have passed are regenerated holographically and given large chunks of the memory of the person who passed and then engage in dialogue with the still living about their relationship and how it's going. I, I thought it was fascinating. It, it doesn't answer. The questions that we're dealing with it just gives you a lot more in the form of a wow understanding of the complicated potential of that sort of technology there are already some startups that are trying to take somebody's email exchanges and sort of to, in order to simulate conversation with somebody who's passed away that that's a junior varsity version of, of that happening now already um, and I hadn't heard of Marjorie Prime before this call, so thanks, Ken and John, for pointing to it. Looks really interesting. Uh, Patty. Um, yeah, um, before we turn towards 2023, this might sound unrelated, but it's be um, becoming it's been coming up for me throughout our conversation. The personally, how I feel, I would like to uh, work on developing my own critical thinking skills, as as we're talking about all these other. Um, I it, it's it's been something I've been curious about for a while, but it continues to feel uh, like it's grabbing my attention more and more. And I would love to um, be pointed towards resources if anyone has any about uh, maybe spaces, places, or books that um, would be supportive in practicing that and developing critical thinking skills. If I don't have access to going to like a community college and taking a class. Um, you can message me personally or put it in the chat, but uh, you seemed like a, a good group to, I trust that there would be some information here. So if anyone cares to share, that'd be appreciated. Um, thanks, Patty. And the, the link I just posted in the chat is the link to Critical Thinking in My Brain, which will, might be a place to browse around. And I will go look there for more resources. But um, others who have thoughts, raise your hand if you've got anything directly or put it in the chat. 
Uh, Ken is going to come up in a moment. So let's go Guild on Ken. Yeah, on the theme of Marjorie Prime and the thing being trained on people's emails to simulate conversations and so forth, which sounds inordinately creepy to me. Uh, but I just read yesterday about an indigenous culture somewhere. I do not have the link uh, where the culture is built around shaman uh, enhanced conversations with ancestors. And apparently it's a large part of the life of that culture. You've just described a bunch of cultures around the world. I don't know who's doing that a lot, but that's this one. That, that was what I was about this, that it seems to be, it's not just an occasional ceremonial thing, but a part of the daily life uh, that's in the lived experience of the people and somehow, and, you know, it, uh, uh, amplified or enhanced by the shaman element in that culture. So that feels very much parallel to what you just described and yet deeply, deeply different. Um, and I'm intrigued by the difference in how we, we, um, not to Ken Homer, we, the uh, the global culture of now, tends to elide that kind of difference uh, uh, in its pursuit of algorithms for everything. Um, also, it's funny, um, the book, The Healing Wisdom of Africa by Maladoma Somme uh, taught me, showed me that in many cultures, in indigenous cultures, shamans and other sorts of people, uh, that's sort of a bad collective noun, but uh, are, are the gatekeepers between this world and other worlds, which to those cultures are as real as uh, the reality of the, the MacBook that I'm talking to you through. Uh, and that in Western culture, we've sort of deprecated and gotten rid of all that kind of stuff, uh, which I think may be limiting our ability to perceive a whole bunch of things that matter a lot and I don't know, messing with reality in all these ways could make that worse, could make that better. And maybe there's ways that, that things get opened up. I don't know. Um, Ken. Um, last week on this call, someone put a link to a Peter Elbow um, paper in the chat, which I, it took me a couple of days to get to, but I found it really amazing. I did post it to the OGM list. It's called The Believing Game. And I actually copied it out and put it into a Word document. So Patty, if you just DM me your email. I'll be glad to send that to you. Uh, it's kind of the the critical uh, complement to critical thinking. Um, critical thinking is the doubting game, and it's how we you know apply our doubts. And the believing game is what if we actually entered into somebody's um, world and took on their beliefs and tested them to see you know how well that would work for us. Um, it doesn't mean we'd take them you know as we're going to just totally absorb it. It means we're going to try it out. And um, I just thought it was a, an amazing paper. So if you haven't had a chance to read it, um, it's it's quite extraordinary. Um, and whoever, I don't remember who posted, I remember Jerry put the link, I remember who read, raised it, but um, thank you, because it really lit me up for a while. Appreciate it. Actually, I I had done I posted it several times. Uh, things one of the, one of the things I'm looking to is actually organize uh, event. And what I, I'm looking for people who are um, certified in the six thinking hats method uh, for facil uh, facilitation method because I I see the believing game kind of being the yellow hat thinking, and then the doubting game is the black hat thinking. So trying to find a group of people who are skilled in facilitating that process is a group I'm looking to engage to help organize that event. Thanks, Carl. And I just realized that I had my mute on a moment ago. Uh, the link that I put in was the Peter Elbow essay that uh, Carl showed us and Ken was mentioning a moment ago. Um, so let's turn the searchlight sort of forward into 2023. What 2022 was really interesting in a lot of the ways that we've been talking about so far, never mind a lot of much more tragic ways like Russia invading Ukraine, et cetera. Um, what does anyone think about uh, 2023? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> Mike. I am horrified with what I'm seeing coming out of China. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's it's almost like the leadership has decided, well, this is our way to really show that we control everything. 
you know, first they locked everybody down and now they're going to kill half a million people. Um, but it's also a way to impose probably permanently an incredible surveillance state, the kind of thing that they have in Northwest China to control a million Uyghurs is now going to be used to control a, a billion people in every corner of, of China. And I, I, I just, it, it, it seems dystopian. Um, maybe I'm, maybe I'm reading the wrong things. Maybe, maybe, maybe they're going to get through it. Okay. I, I, but, but I, I just, it, it's horrifying. Well, and, I was and gonna... I'm reading a tweet from somebody who said, for weeks, I heard it. I didn't know anybody who had COVID. Now, everybody in my building has COVID. Everybody in my child's school has COVID. Wow. I mean, it's just, and they're not even testing. It's just everybody has the symptoms. It's just running around. Um, I was on a call yesterday where people were talking about the digital yuan, basically uh, central bank digital currencies, CBDCs or whatever that is. But in particular, uh, China's move toward that where... They will have a programmable official currency. They want to move everybody to it. And once you've got a programmable currency, you be, you can begin to detect and clamp down on illicit transactions that use that digital currency. You can begin to trace everybody and every use of it. You can create a dystopian, crazy future that may make it very efficient. I mean, you'd have to then... And I learned about... Um, um, inside money and outside money and private money terms I had never heard before. Um, and private money is, is money that is sort of outside the system and where you can sort of go, go make deals. Uh, outside money is money outside of the normal uh, system like gold or cryptocurrencies. And so I think all those things are up for grabs and have tremendous uh, privacy implications. Uh, Gil and Doug C. Yeah, Mike, you're a little late to using the word dystopian with China. Um, the, the digital currency is fascinating because it, it, it's going to save enormous amount of money on prisons because you won't have to arrest people. You just cut off their money and let them drift. Uh, you know, the massive control. What strikes me about China is the um, is the glaring defect of authoritarian systems. And, you know, I, I keep coming back to Ross Ashby's law of requisite variety. And you go from, you know, total lockdown system to total not lockdown system because, of, you know, a small group of ruling people decide that's what's the thing to do. Uh, massive decisions without enough uh, without enough information and nuance, uh, and it will be held to pay. United States is just starting to lock down travel in from China. Uh, companies are disinvesting. Uh, Lord knows where this will go, um, and it uh, it recalls for me um, our our old friend Max Headroom, who had his what uh, was it fortieth anniversary uh, this year at Max and the world of the blanks. Uh, you know, the people who who lived outside the digital system somehow, whether it's going to be possible in China or not, I don't know. I think there's a non-zero chance of Xi losing his lifetime premiership uh, in the next 12 months, but who knows? Doug Carmichael? Yeah, this is so complicated. Uh, I think we misperceived China. Uh, and I would, here's a... a, a a thumbnail sketch of the recent Chinese history. What they did is went through a major period of raising the income of a large part of the country. Mm -hmm. She says, okay, we did that, but we have two problems. Inequality is still very powerful and corruption is very powerful. So I'm devoting my career, the rest of it, to correcting those two things. Mm -hmm. The world economy is impacting China in a way that's making it harder for him to govern. Uh, but what's striking to me is that he does have a social policy. Uh, we don't. Uh, we have no view of where we're going, uh, and we have no agreement on what the major problems are. So I would say that there's a chance that China is in a better place than the U.S. is to deal with climate change, which might require things like lots of surveillance, uh, a lot of uncomfortable authoritarian moves. Uh, I don't want to go there, but uh, I don't want to go to the other place either. That is where we just keep drifting, which is what we're doing. Uh, and how we, in, in this conversation, get out of the drift about climate change seems to me like a serious problem. 
<laughs> Just to uh, to build on what Doug says, two things. One is um, um, very few Westerners have done a, a real survey of Chinese history over the past 5,000 years, and it's a very different story uh, than what we glean from our mass media. It's a complex and rich and long-standing civilization with a long history of internal battles and authoritarianism and such, and has been, as Doug said, done an absolutely astounding transformation in the last 50 years in terms of poverty, just absolutely astounding. Um, the other thing that China has, <clears throat> which is pretty much unknown in the West, is an ecological society policy. This was adopted by Central Committee two or three or maybe four or five year plans ago. Uh, and uh, it's important to look at uh, to look at the at China's moves, um, you know, and people's skepticism about China's climate policy and, you know, still reliance on coal and so forth in the context of a top level commitment to ecological society, which in some ways is the things that many of us have been dreaming about for decades uh, in the context of an authoritarian state. So it's unhappy uh, for us hippies and Democrats, uh, but there's something very profound in the background of what's happening in China that we are pretty much blind to. Um, Gil, I'm really interested by, and I think it has a lot to do with OGMness and all that, um, what you're saying in China relative to the U.S., for example, and one of the things that I said, I've said in conversation a few times in the last month or two, are that it's weird that in the U.S. we're busy trying to keep the U.S. from becoming the handmaid's tale mm -hmm. instead of collaborating to address things that like have dug up every, you know, uh, Doug Carmichael up all the time and trying to steer us toward and everybody else worried. Um, and is that just because democracy is messy? Is that just because politics is broken? Is that because we can't sort things out or people aren't being clear? Like, well, how, how do we get closer to, and, and I don't know that we can have an organized method for all of this, but we could have rules of fair play that might make it a lot easier to move forward, right? I, I would, yeah, and there's a big conversation to have there and let's key, key, key that up maybe for two weeks from now. But I would just say that, you know, yeah, democracy is messy and it always has been. <clears throat> <clears throat> but democracy in the context of Citizens United, uh, where bribery has been legalized, uh, where the ratio of lobbyists to uh, electeds has gone like, what, two orders of magnitude difference in the last 50 years, um, and where uh, at latest count, there are three people in the United States who have the wealth of half of the United States. So uh, in that context, democracy is real messy. Because it's you know it's it's warped. So you know so when we talk about democracy, we have to talk about the one we have now and the one we have if it were regulated uh, to control the distortions of wealth. China's chosen a different direction, which is very much in their tradition, um, as democracy is in its various forms in our tradition. So we're not going to be them, and they're not going to be us. Um, but to Doug's point, um, you know, we have to play together, and that playing together is, is is sort of moved back off the table, I think, in the recent in the recent events. Um, TikTok as well as COVID, right? Thank you, Scott. Go ahead. A uh, very quick comment. Um, you had said something about government and politics, I believe, that um, I did a quick search in my own brain, and I found a quote, free speech allows the public discussion necessary for democratic self-government. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to me, that's connecting back to where we started with one of the reasons that being able to post to everyone is a good thing is that all of our opinions get out there and so we can collectively see where where we are where where things should move and when those opinions because everyone's post is is their own perspective their own opinion when those get muddled with artificially generated content that has I think even the creators of those applications would say it has no place in that discussion. It has no vote. It has no interest in whether we vote liberal or conservative or whether we vote for guns or vote against guns or vote, you know, whatever. If, if that public discourse is sullied 
with a lot of content that is, well, remember that classic uh, essay on bullshit, I think, which I think is, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful piece where it says that people who do that, liars know that they're telling a lie, but, but the bullshitter doesn't care. They just are saying whatever it is that they need to say to get in the moment. So it's just an interesting thought that, that occurred to me that, that, well, who cares if there's all this language out there that's, that's useful for us and that we can incorporate in things? Well, what if it's all, if what we're doing is trying to gather the thoughts of other people around us, and now we can't because those are, there's not a fellow citizen, shall we say? I don't know if that's the right term. Anyway. So much is the, of this is about things like citizenship and being citizens instead of being consumers and all that. I've been fretting around this for a long time. Michael, what was yours? Um, I'm, uh, I've been, been back and forth in the conversation, so I might be a little off topic, but I think this relates to what Scott was just saying and certainly to um, some things that came earlier. Um, I, I want to present uh, a slightly optimistic um, view of what chat GPT could do in the in the coming months and years. And in 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 terms of political dialogue, um, I think things like chat GPT are not as good because they're not as good as at, you know, stuff like sarcasm and shaming and, you know, all the nasty stuff that goes on in the Twitter sphere and, and, um, and just, you know, making dumb snarky comments. Um, the idea that a, a room full of, um, of people you could converse with would be able to be the sum of you know, we talked about dead people, but let's talk about, you know, putting together the logical points of certain people with different political points of view to try to thrash out issues on your own without getting into the who's wearing a red and who's wearing a blue jersey um, to, to work out a problem. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of potential for that for people dealing with personal issues as well. Um, you know, would, would people be willing to, um, to deputize a digital twin to have a non-heated conversation with a business partner or a life partner or a parent or something to just putting feelings aside hash out something a little bit and then bring the results um, to each other, you know, in political context, personal context, business context, et cetera. Um, I, I think there's some potential there. Um, and, and I hope that, um, that, you know, with full transparency, with, with people knowing what they're doing, um, that it's more useful than people sitting there and honing their own arguments for themselves, for their political marketplace effect. Um, so yeah, that's just my thought. Thank you, Michael. Um, 2023, other thoughts? Is so, if we do this a year from now, are we going to be shocked at how dramatic changes were in 2023? Or is it going to be another year sort of like this one where, wow, this showed up. Wow, that showed up. I think um, we'll be shocked by a couple of the examples of where GPT gets applied. I mean, there were a lot of academics were shocked to, to see how quickly their students were writing term papers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey. Uh, it's like the guy who outsourced his job a couple of years ago but went in, into, into the gig economy and sat playing games at his desk while other people did his work. Uh, Doug B, then Ken, then Doug C. And you're muted. 
So a slightly different orientation point to your question. Um, if, if any given present moment holds unlimited opportunity and potential. Um, the question for me more is what do I do with 2023? And um, like that really came in in the last week as a result of a couple of conversations and um, feeling sense into what I was feeling was needed, you know, the, that eternal question, like what's needed right now. And um, I'm, and really, you know, resonance with, with Doug about like what's needed right now is a global wake up, like immediate wake up <laughs> and, um, and how to trigger that um, and, and cause the kind of viral, spontaneous shift out of what we've been doing to what we need to be doing differently. Um, and so that's like burning for me. And I think 2023 is soon to be the present moment and now, and what do we do with it? Uh, how do we make sure it's not the same in a year from now? We're not sitting in the same position, but with bearer cupboards and more social unrest and, and millions and millions and millions of people around the world starving to death. So um, I, it's, it's a much more vital proactive inquiry to me. <laughs> um, and what can I slash we do or what can I do to galvanize a group of people to turn it into a, what we're doing in service to turning that into a greater group of people doing um, to change the course? Anyone with pragmatic suggestions to answer Doug's question right now, please get in the queue and then Doug C. Um. Somewhere back in the 90s in, in Context Magazine, there was something published called the Innovation Diffusion Game, which um, conceives of culture as an amoeba. And the way amoebas move is they sort of put out a pod and they start to gravitate towards that pod. But sometimes on the opposite end, another pod will go out in the opposite direction and it gets pulled. And in some instances, the amoeba will actually split into two. Um, so I've just always felt that was a really great um, metaphor for culture change. And you can, it, because it allows you to see things that are happening very positively and very negatively in the same thing without, without them being contrary. There's just there's, there, it's the way things are moving. And um, some of the things that have really heartened me, I mean, it's really easy to look around the world and see stuff that's terrible and go, oh my God, um, you know, we could spend hours and hours on that. But um, I really felt like this last election, we dodged a bullet here in the US, we could have gone down a really dark path. And um, I, uh, oh, thanks, Jerry. Um, uh, that just, it lifted my spirits tremendously because it, it's like, I, tr I trust evolution. I think that humans are really stupid collectively and very brilliant individually, but I also trust that evolution you know, did not bring our intelligence into the world in order for us to take ourselves out of it. And somehow we're going to get there. I have no idea how. I really don't. It's like, it's too too big for me to see. But I just, I, I, I that's my foundation. And I found that if I don't have that foundation, then I, I'm very wobbly in the world. So I just have to trust that things are going to, you know, somehow in the end, it will work out. There may be enormous suffering. You know, there might be billions of us lost. I don't know. And, and certainly there's already been incalculable damage to the biosphere um and we'll spend the rest of our existence trying to repair that or a good portion of it but i'm just um looking around yeah evolution's lots of dead ends i mean evolution has one dictate uh learn or die learning is 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 required survival is optional um and i'm trusting that we're going to come to a, a a better level of understanding individually and collectively um I look at stuff like Braver Angels, which is doing a great job of, of helping to depolarize blue and red people or whatever you want to label them. 
and one of the things I was reading in, in a new newsletter from them recently was a man who said, you know, there are too many people who have a vested interest in turning us against each other. We need to, to recognize that. Um, there are way more people who are interested in working together than there are in dividing us. And yet divide and conquer has been a, a wonderful way for people to assume power for, I don't know, a thousand years. So I'm hopeful that we're going to, um, we're going to start to see a lot more of that waking up and saying, you know, who's benefiting here by turning me against my neighbor? Uh, certainly not us. So that's just one of the things that I'm, I'm focused on for 2023 is, is less volatility in the social media sphere. I think people are really tired of, of finding fault and, you know, trolling and, and creating all this, this um, horrible stuff. I, I think people are just sick of it. They want to, they want to actually work and find ways to make things work. So I might be Pollyanna here. I don't know, but it's what keeps me going. And Ken, part of my beliefs, uh, belief system is that a lot of what the, what's going on right there is intentional. It's strategy. And um, I'm busy trying to figure out how do you undermine, diffuse, dampen, mitigate, or otherwise uh, pop that strategy. And one of the ways is to give people a, a, a real path for authentic lives with meaning and, and, and enough, <clears throat> enough stuff around them that they don't want to lose it, and, and including community. So I think there's a lot of that. Uh, Doug C. Uh, sorry, Ken, you wanted to jump back in? Go ahead. I was going to say one of the things in Dawn of Everything was um, I came away leaning much more towards anarchy than I had been in the past. Because um, they mentioned, you know, for the uh, the woodland Indians in the in the Northeast uh, of the U.S. in the 17th, 18th centuries, there was there was private property. Uh, the men owned their own hunting implements. Women owned their their uh, means of of farming and whatnot. But they shared the bounty of the harvest and the hunt. And so everyone had the means for an autonomous life. And once everyone is guaranteed the means for an autonomous life, then you can have tremendous variety and individuality. And if we would just say, all right. We're going to make sure everybody has the means for an autonomous life, then that would change the game tremendously. And I actually think we might be moving towards that. There's much more embrace of universal basic income and, you know, tax the billionaires back to middle class status. And so I'm hopeful. If we can solve for that, we solve a lot of things. I'm going to pass the con to Ken and say Happy New Year. Um, and thank you so much. But um, Thanks. We'll see you in the next year. Thank you, Jerry. Happy New Year. Thanks for, for hosting these calls, all these and everything you do to, to curate them. It's, it's a big um, thing in my life that makes me feel good and happy. I really appreciate you. I yes. appreciate that very much. Thank you, Ken. Thanks, everybody. <clears throat> all right. Doug Carmichael. Okay. Um... I think it's very hard to get to a positive scenario about the future without acknowledging the negative scenarios because they are the ground in which we're gonna be uh, trying to put together uh, something that's better. The most obvious negative scenario to me is that we're not gonna do anything. We're gonna drift and the temperature is gonna continue to rise uh, until it leads to some kind of social breakdown. In that context, can we pull out a positive scenario? Uh, I think we can, but we've got to acknowledge the negative ones first. Uh, they're much more probable. Uh, we, we've got to, I think, end up working for improbable scenarios to try and make them work, and that's going to be really hard. Do you, um, do you have any advice for people who are working on making the improbable possible? Uh, I think we live in a world where right now everybody wants to get from where we are to a better place. I think we're going to have to go through a worse place first. There's got to be some falling apart before we can put things together. How far that goes is not clear. I would just say to people who want to work on this that they be honest with their own feelings uh, and uh, be willing to work on more complex futures. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Stacy. Yeah, earlier, um, Jerry used the phrase about um, playing by the playing by the rules. And I just wanted to say that 
people play by their own sets of rules. And I found that, well, first of all, I think it's, I, I don't think we're ever going to get everybody to play by the same set of rules. And I don't know that it's even meant to be like that anyway. So for me, it's about finding people who want to play by the same set of rules and are consistent in it. So they don't play by one set when they're with one group of people or in one situation. And going into 2023, what I'd like to do, I do it anyway, but what I really would like to do more of is start having more conversations about our own ethics and our own morals and almost play with these, what would you do if, and get to know each other better that way. Because, you know, as upset as Doug C gets about, you know, not talking about climate change, the truth is for me, if I can't be comfortable with people in this moment, I don't care about where the future is because I don't want to be with a bunch of miserable people anyway. I'd rather, I'd rather just see where my soul goes next. And I'm complete. Thanks, Stacey. Um, I just want to make one comment on that. Now that I have Jerry's seat, I get to comment on people. So, um, <laughs> um, Michael Mead talks about the Gnostic move. The Gnostic move is the spiritual move that says, we're all one. If we could just see we're all one, everybody get along and all our problems would be solved. And the problem is the spiritual move is disembodied. It gets up above everything and it sees it as all one. But the ensouled embodied move is, is when you recognize there's self and other. And um, everybody has this pull of individuality and collective within them. And uh, we have to um, recognize that there are there is one species, but there are many people. There are many tribes. And until we can legitimize the people, who's the, the tribes that we say, we don't like your way of that you tribe and therefore you know we're going to delegitimize you we're going to kill you we're going to whatever it is we're going to have trouble trouble so how do we create containers where different tribes can come together and talk through what they need to feel safe in order to work together can yep. i just say something real oh, quick please please yeah i just want to say forget about the tribes it starts with just your friends because even with people you're close to there are going to be aspects of each other that you're going to see as, you know, being wrong or not right and not recognizing that there's something else you're not seeing. So my suggestion would be forget about the other tribes, you know, let's just deal with what's right in front of us. Like you brought up mile, the mile situation. That was a terrible situation. I, I disagree with how that went down. We can save that for another time. But if we can't do that with people we know, who are we to say what other try, you know, about other tribes? So, exactly. Yeah. Thanks. Mr. Friend. Ken, Ken, I appreciate that you're slowing down the rhythm of the conversation a little bit. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> um, you know, the Zen monkeys talk about not one, not two. We're not separate. We're not the same. How do we live in that paradox? Um, uh, I just, Niels Bohr told me yesterday, <laughs> what did he tell me? He said, uh, how wonderful that we have met with a paradox. Now we have some hope of making progress. So, you know, there we are living in that. Um, I wanna roll back to a couple of things. Um, um, yeah, Doug, uh, I, um, Doug C, working for impossible scenarios is an attractive provocation. Um, I, I dropped a Sun Rock quote in the chat, the possible has been tried and failed. Now it's time to try the impossible. So maybe that uh, can go into your stew pot here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm backing up a few minutes and I'm reminded of the Arundhati Roy quote, which people know about uh, another world is coming. I can hear her breathing. But the other part of the quote that's uh, rarely cited uh, she says um, uh, uh, they be few and we be many they need us more than we need them so that that orbits in this conversation for me um <clears throat> i i came across an uh, uh, an article i guess it was last week from Yanis varoufakis the former greek finance minister uh um and self-identified libertarian Marxist, an interesting guy who offered a theory of change that I was surprised is 
a lot like what I've been not so consciously operating with for the past 50 years, which he says, look, <clears throat> um, we uh, and uh, with regard to climate, we know a lot of what needs to be done. Uh, we have a lot of the tools and technologies and systems and policies somewhere on this planet working at some level in development at some level. So number one, let's push those forward as far as we can. Number two, share them so that people can adopt them and use them and taste them and feel them and like them and say, I want this. Uh, I want this technology. I want this future. Step two. And then step three, they realize they can't have it. In the world that we're in, they can't have that. They can't have that to the degree that they want. And then the question is, why not? What's in the way of that? Who's in the way of that? How do we move on that? So that three-step stack, I thought, was very cogent and powerful. And is, is, is a lot of what many of us are doing uh, anyway, but it gave a name to it uh, <clears throat> that I thought was very powerful. Um, and I see Doug C's hand up. Now, I don't believe that we have the knowledge that we need. Uh, in the forefront is we need to cut the burning of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. We have no plan on how to do that uh, at scale. Um, I'm saying and he's saying that we have the technology to do that at scale. We don't. Sure we do. I don't believe we do. But, well, it's not a technology problem. It's a stopping the burning of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Gil. Um, th this is probably more detail. We want to get go far into this conversation. But for example, if we put a, you know, when California was innovating with the $12 per ton carbon fee price, uh, Sweden was at $160 a ton. Uh, the United States government was 35. The U.S. did a bottom-up analysis of what's the social cost of carbon and how we mitigate that. Sweden said, what price do we need for carbon in order to drive the society to carbon free? So there's a technology called a real price on carbon, whether it's $160 a ton or $1,600 a ton. We know what that is. Politically, we can't do that at this point. Um, we know how to build carbon neutral buildings. Um, a friend of mine was just in a school in Austria, 500 student school, built a passive house standard. The heating plant uh, was a box, um, um, you know, three, imagine a three foot cube with a bucket of wood pellets. And they fired that up at 3 a.m. every Monday morning for a few hours and then shut it off. And for the rest of the week, the school was heated by the bodies of the students at lower first co lower capital cost than building a normal school. We know how to do that stuff. We ain't doing it. And so the point, Doug, is not that we have all of it, but we have enough of it to push the provocation to have people, if people know about this, to say, why can't we have that? And then we get into the more complicated social and political questions. Anyhow. Building the carbon neutral school, uh, we know how to do. What we don't know how to do is that the building of the carbon neutral school uses a tremendous amount of carbon uh, in mining and materials and transportation and so on. We do not have a solution to that problem. Well, that's next. So I think one of the challenges is, is we have this end goal of carbon neutrality, and then there's the scaffolding and the bridging technologies that will get us there. And there's no one single thing path like we're going to do this and we'll get there. There's going to be a whole bunch of things coming from multiple areas. And it's it makes it very hard to see. But I'm I'm with Gil. I think we have an awful lot of the technologies available, maybe not every one, but enough to make a significant shift. And it's it's getting the political will or a political system capable of acting on a will that is going to actually move us in that direction. That is, is the really hard problem. And that is actually a social problem, not a technology problem. And that's where the viral focus thing I think is key, because if we say to people, we want you to go make this enormous effort and all these sacrifices for a future that, I, that we can't describe to you, that we can't help you imagine, and that you have no sense of whether it's possible or not, that's a very difficult political challenge. 
And if we can give people a taste of it and they say, I like this, I want this, then, mm -hmm. then, then, then the next challenge, and you're, Greg, you're right, there are many layers of challenges to do this, but motivating the will from, from hopelessness and despair and nihilism to, I can taste the world that I want and I can imagine it. And I can imagine bringing pieces of it forward uh, with, our, you know, with, with, with the people that I live with. Uh, to me, that that holds much more possibility. Anyhow, I've, I don't want to monopolize the conversation here. Stop. Okay, before I go to you, I saw Stacy put her hand up briefly. Stacy, did you want to say something? Yeah, real quick. And I'm asking this question for a specific reason. I think Barry might appreciate it. I just, I just want to know, and I'm going to use electric cars as an example. Is there an actual study where it showed if we replaced all the cars we have now with electric cars, doesn't matter how, if miraculously it was all replaced and everything were being operated, what the differences would be? Because I know what happens, you know, people just argue and they don't have numbers. And I see Gail, I see Gail wants to answer me, but this has to do with political will because so many uninformed people are creating all this noise that nothing ever gets done. Gil, did you want to say something? Quick answer, yes, there are lots of studies. Um, um, to those who say electric cars are more polluting, not true. It obviously depends on the power source that's providing electricity, but no, not true. To Doug C's point, the, um, the resources required to replace the current worldwide fleet in terms of steel and rubber and everything else is vast. Uh, and it's a perfect example of why it's not just a choice between A and B, but it could be a choice between why not why not cities that don't require everybody to have their own personal car or two or three to live their lives uh, and invest in public transportation and walkable cities and so forth that mean a lot less cars to replace the current fleet of fossils. And yes, there's there's extensive work on that. I'm happy to connect you with it if you want to dive in. No, no, no. My my point my point was just that sometimes we get the answers, but we don't get the little details in between, so that people could come up with alternative approaches, and it becomes an all or nothing thing. That's really where I was. And Barry also, I see. Plethora of detail out there if you want it. Barry. Yeah, just yeah, I'll to, get to you in a second. Just yeah, just to add a detail. The sun delivers 1500 kilowatts per square meter to the surface of the earth, which is a lot of energy, but we're, we don't have really good technologies for capturing that energy and putting it to good use. If we could somehow develop the technology for solar capture, solar photon capture, there's a, more than enough energy. So that's, that's, that's the one problem that has to be solved. And then you, then you have all the energy you needed without carbon. I want to get back to one other thing that uh, Stacy brought up, and that's about different communities have different rules. And so you have this issue of like, which set of rules am I obliged to play by in a given community? And that, that concept that there is a rule-based framework that could work if we only had the right set of rules, that's a common axiom in our culture. But if you study, <laughs> the mathematics and the dynamics of rule-based systems, if you, if you really want to get to a culture of ethical best practices, where everybody is trying to work out ethical best practices in the moment, and you say, I want to reduce that down to a framework of rules, you're lost. Because rule-based systems can, are not powerful enough to support ethical best practices. In fact, what rules support are games and dramas and chaotic dynamics. And that belief that rule-based systems suffice if you only had the right set of rules, that is a mathematical falsehood that humans adopted some 6,000 years ago. 20th century mathematics showed us that rule-based systems are inherently chaotic. They, they define games and drama. And yes, you can, you can evolve from rule-based frameworks to a framework of ethical best practices, which requires some advanced mathematics and system models how we're ever going to get there with our population of homo schleppians is beyond me. Thanks, Barry. Doug B. Yeah, I just, there's a 3,000 pound gorilla, which is the, the controlling force in our, in the global economy is the economy is money. 
and private wealth and private interest. And um, historically, anybody that's thought about hit, hitting that machine, affecting significant change in that machine is dead. <laughs> um, and and uh, that's sort of a bigger problem. That's sort of a bigger problem because everything that's been said works if it were a rational, transparent, truly democratic and egalitarian context. And it isn't. Um, now, pulling a group of people around a table to figure out how to crack that nut, which isn't about po something polar or adversarial. It's about negotiation <laughs> um, with the few in service to the all. Um, they're gonna have to be given something that has leaves them feeling safe and secure in their privilege on the far side. Um, for them to let go of the totalitarian control that they exert, in fact, over things not changing. And um, if that isn't part of the equation, then um, nothing changes. We are at time. Is there anybody who'd like to Say anything before we go. Besides Happy New Year. Or some other happy tweet. Um, I do have a poem. I realized I needed to grab a poem. So um, this is Zimborska again, Vistava Zimborska. Um, it's called The Contribution to Statistics. I think it's somehow related to what we're talking about here today. Out of 100 people, those who always know better 52, doubting every step, nearly all the rest. Glad to lend a hand if it doesn't take too long, as high as 49. Always good because they can't be otherwise. Four, well, maybe five. Able to admire without envy, 18. Suffering illusions induced by fleeting youth, 60, give or take a few not to be taken lightly, 40 and four. Living in constant fear of someone or something, 77. Capable of happiness, 20 something tops. Harmless singly, savage in crowds, half at least. Cruel when forced by circumstances, better not to know even ballpark figures. Wise after the fact, just a couple more than wise before it. Taking only things from life, 30. I wish I were wrong. Hunched in pain, no flashlight in the dark, 83 sooner or later. Righteous, 35, which is a lot. Righteous and understanding, three. Worthy of compassion, 99. Mortal, a hundred out of a hundred. Thus far, this figure still remains unchanged. Ooh. Worthy of compassion, 99. That line always jumps out at me. Out of a hundred, there's one that actually is not worthy of compassion. And if we allow ourselves to be tricked into thinking that they are, we get trapped into some very bad stuff. So... Uh, I know you're all worthy of compassion. I've really enjoyed spending time with you on these calls. And I just want to appreciate, you know, I'm at this stage of my life where little things mean a lot. And, you know, at the end of the year, I like to reflect on what I value. And I have valued hearing from each and every one of you and those that I've created relationships with. Thank you so much. I don't have a link to that, Gil. It's, it's in my library, but I'll send it to you if you like. Love it. Thank or you. I'll, I'll post it. I'll post it to the OGM list so everybody can have access to it that way. Um, 
So I wish you all well in the coming year and look forward to seeing you on these calls and just have a great safe time. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year. Take care. Bye-bye. Happy New Year, all.